Book Talk begins at 5 minutes and 49 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 667. Thank you for your faith. This week we would like to highlight Heather Moore Farley, Elaine Leahy, Gabrielle Harvey, Diane Shantz, Michelle Schrader, and our very newest patron, Charles Hutchinson. Thank you so much for your support. We could not do this without you. Thank you. Well, hello, how are you? I'm okay. I've had another week of ups and downs, but more ups than downs, so I'll take it. Recording episodes always sets me back a bit, so I, I imagine by the time Friday rolls around, I will have started to rally again, but but I'm not expecting to do much tomorrow, also because they're replacing our air conditioning unit here tomorrow, which means Andrew broke down a lot of the space that I use in the basement, which is great because now I can have a much easier time of cleaning stuff out and getting rid of things that I don't need. And that is a huge, huge boon that Andrew gave me, uh, just a real gift. So uh, thank you, Universe, for the air conditioning unit. And thank you, Andrew, for a clean floor. One of the things I wanted to let you know this week is that Eric has now uploaded all of War of the Worlds and Bleak House the first 17 chapters of Bleak House to YouTube, to the channel membership. So if you aren't on Patreon or you don't use the app and the premium feed on the app to listen to premium content, you can still access it over at YouTube, craftlit-channel. That makes it easy. Along with those things happening, we have our book and movie for August and September. Our book, I am very excited to say, is going to be The Lore Gatherers, which was written by Jonathan Uffelman. You may recall, if you listen to North and South, Professor Uffelman, that's Papa. And if you listen to any of the Bertie Wooster stories over on, that was a premium book quite a while ago, Jonathan did the reading for that. And if you listen to Lady Susan, Jonathan was the grown up in the room. He always does a marvelous job. He's just one of the best actors I've ever known. And he's one of the people who are in the recording of The Importance of Being Earnest, which Eric and I are still still working on. It's going to take a while, and there's no way Eric's going to have time to do it until we're in a break between books again. So it'll happen, I promise, just not now. So that is our August book, The Lore Gatherers. There'll be links in the show notes for you if you want to go and purchase it. Jonathan will be able to join us for the book party. So you will be able to ask him any questions you like. I'm sure he can, (laughs) guy knows how to improv. So there's really probably nothing you can say that would scare him. He will be able to answer you both about writing and about acting. Then for September, listener Rebecca recommended Aisha, which is an Indian film that is Emma. So like Clueless was Emma in the 90s. Aisha is a modern Emma in India. I am ecstatic. I am going to spend the next two months making sure that I can get a hold of a copy to show you. And it may take that long, but it's going to be worth it. I'm very excited. So that is our September movie for our September watch night over on Discord. Again, all of these things take place on the Discord server. So if you are paying for a membership, if you are paying for a Patreon, if you are paying for premium content on the app, make sure you get yourself over to Discord. We will put a a link into the show notes about how and where and join in there. The reason is my Zoom account is being used on Thursday nights for our Thursday night Zoom. And I don't want to kick everybody out of the Zoom. Discord allows us to do the same thing, but on a different platform. 
and then everybody wins, which is awesome. We also have a new raffle for August, the book Heirloom Knitting. This is one of my books that I've had and and have not used in at least 10 years. It is exactly the kind of book that you want if you really want to knit lace. I don't think it gets much better than this. So it's a marvelous book and the link to the raffle is in the show notes. So you can go and sign up for that. So today's episode is a little bit different and it'll make sense why I'm doing this when I get to the end. I call this episode, Thank You for Your Faith, for real reasons. For much of my life as a Gen Xer, I have felt that I had to apologize for or explain my love of books and literature and story. Growing up in the 80s when everything seemed to be focused on making money and greed is good, it was a time when smart kids were made to feel bad, like outsiders in their own classrooms. And growing up in that environment made it difficult for me to feel that there was any value in the humanities, any value in what I loved. After all, if it wasn't going to pull in a cool six figures a year, what's the point? But during the pandemic, and I can only speak for myself here, obviously, it was interesting in a sad way to watch parents suddenly have to deal with how hard it is to teach. That love and respect for teachers didn't seem to have lasted or translated into them getting paid more, but it's nice to be able to point people back to those memories as touchstones. Part of the important part of lockdown, I think, was seeing how desperate people were for stories, compelling stories, bad stories. Pablum could only go so far. We were sharing books, Netflix shows, YouTube videos, whatever we felt was quality that caught our attention and that made us think about something other than just navel gazing about the miserable situation we were all in. I bring this up because yesterday Andrew shared a video of a talk given at IWM Vienna that changed everything for me. Timothy Snyder who is well-known in some circles for his books on tyranny, on freedom, and the road to unfreedom, he gave a speech, the title of which I am not going to share with you because I don't want it to scare you off. The title does not a match. It's hard to explain just how amusing and entertaining he is and have you believe me after you've seen that title. It's like Bleak House being the worst title for a thoroughly enjoyable book. Same thing. Minute or so of dead space before the video starts. And then... Timothy Snyder opens with a list of questions that I think are some of the most important questions we can be asking ourselves to date. And what follows those questions is, for me, the most important realignment of my understanding of humans that I've had since reading the book Humankind, A Hopeful History by Rutger Bregman, which is still a marvelous book. The importance of what Timothy Snyder has to say in his talk, I don't think can be overemphasized. He is telling us stories about ourselves telling stories. And one of the things that becomes very clear is the motivation behind that. We often tell stories because we want to cast ourselves as the main character. That's not news. When we read books, we often see ourselves as the main character. This is why representation is so important. What is news is that in these stories, often the main character, you, are solely there to save everyone else to sacrifice yourself to save others. You are the knight in shining armor. But that can also put you straight into Plato's cave, where you think you're the only one who can see the truth. And if you don't know how Plato's cave ends, I'll put a link in the show notes for you. And because that truth that you're seeing from the cave is so bad, such a huge threat to the people you care about, to the world, You are willing to do almost anything to save everybody else. This is fine when the threat is real, like climate change, but not when threats are being manufactured. Timothy Snyder talks a lot about offerings, sacrifice, old pagan needs for offering the thing that matters most to you, food, gold, your children. These are stories we read all the time in Greek mythology, as well as in Norse mythology, and These stories absolutely show up in other places and other histories as well. But those are the two that I mentioned, that Timothy mentioned, and they're the two that I'm also most familiar with. So riffing off of this idea of offerings, I agree with Snyder that one of the things we do these days without really noticing it is offering up our time to our phones. And I know how ironic it is for me to say that because there's a 90% chance of you being 
on your phone right now listening to this. I get that. The irony is not lost on me. But I also know that you are different. Simply by listening to this podcast, I know you. You are not sitting there passively consuming this content. You talk back to me, even if I can't hear you. I know you do because everybody tells me they do. And you make, by the way, excellent points. You also aren't sitting there vegetating and looking at a screen. Even if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm 90% sure you are not watching carefully. Glancing up, sure, but you've got other things to do. You are most likely in the act of creation. Whether that creation is creating a meal or creating a cleaner home or creating a piece of art or creating a gift for someone, craftlet people are builder uppers, not terror downers. And if Timothy Snyder is right, you and young people like you are who is going to matter the most for pulling us out of the situation that we find ourselves in all around the world. So I wanted to thank you for having faith in the stories that we listen to on Craftlet, for believing that humanities can teach us how to live better and happier, and for loving creation, for sacrificing your time to great literature. So Andrew sent me this video, and now I'm sending it to you. It's long. Don't look at the time code. It's entertaining. And importantly, it does not need to be watched because it is just him talking. And while he's very charming and, and watching his hand movements is kind of fun, it's certainly not necessary. This talk matters to me because it is the first time our current cultural turmoil has made any sense to me, period. This ritual, this listening to stories, this sacrifice of your time is possibly the most important thing that you do every week, not because of me, but because of what stories do for us all. After you've listened to Snyder, what I just said will make more sense. And now I'm pretty sure you think I'm just crazy, but, but I have faith in the power of story. And I've always had the belief that it is a marvelous cross-section of humans who listen to Craftlet. That faith, these beliefs can make the world we want to see. Science is not the place for faith or belief. It's a place for facts. You know I get woogie about using language precisely in the books that we read. So anytime you hear anyone outside of the humanities, and I'm including religion as a humanity here, anytime you hear non-humanities people starting to use the words faith and belief, please pay attention because something is wrong. They are sacrificing for something that doesn't track. I don't, for example, believe that several planes hit several big important buildings 23 years ago. I don't have faith in my doctor being able to diagnose me correctly. The former, I know because I was there, and so in my life this is an empirical fact, and the latter, I choose my doctor because they're good, accurate, kind, smart, and well-trained. Not because I hope they're good, not because I have faith in their ability to produce miracles and make me better, but because they do their job as well as I could possibly ask them for. So why am I talking about this before this chapter of Emma? This chapter of Emma is one that I've been dreading since we started the book. It's one of those moments like when Jews show up in Dickens or, or the Irish are blamed for everything in North and South. It's not comfortable to see authors falling into those tropes and those stereotypes, no matter what era they were writing in. It's, it's a disappointment. However, we don't expect Jane Austen to be any better than she possibly could have been when she was writing, and therefore I don't fault her at all for this. But I also know that the people who are involved in this chapter have been horribly maligned and names put upon them by outsiders have been used as weapons. I don't know more than that. I've actually spent the last two weeks trying to get a hold of several experts to bring them on, and everybody's on summer vacation, so maybe later we'll be graced with their knowledge. But if you know anything about the people who we are about to encounter in this chapter, please, please, please write or call. You can write heather at craplet.com or call 206-350-1642. What I'm really looking for is historical, factual evidence. What has happened to these people? What has happened to the Romani, the travelers? You'll hear an example of that at 
the end of today's episode. So with all that said, there is literally nothing else that I need to do to get you into today's chapter. So let's listen to volume three, chapter three, or chapter 39 of Jane Austen's Emma. If you are listening to your own version, please fast wind to 24 minutes and 33 seconds. Volume 3, Chapter 3 This little explanation with Mr. Knightley gave Emma considerable pleasure. It was one of the agreeable recollections of the ball, which she walked about the lawn next morning to enjoy. She was extremely glad that they had come to so good an understanding respecting the Eltons, and that their opinions of both husband and wife were so much alike, and his praise of Harriet, his concession in her favour, was peculiarly gratifying. The impertinence of the Eltons, which for a few minutes had threatened to ruin the rest of her evening, had been the occasion of some of its highest satisfactions, and she looked forward to another happy result, the cure of Harriet's infatuation. From Harriet's manner of speaking of the circumstance before they quitted the ballroom, she had strong hopes. It seemed as if her eyes were suddenly opened, and she were enabled to see that Mr. Elton was not the superior creature she had believed him. The fever was over, and Emma could harbour little fear of the pulse being quickened again by injurious courtesy. She depended on the evil feelings of the Eltons for supplying all the discipline of pointed neglect that could be farther requisite. Harriet rational, Frank Churchill not too much in love, and Mr. Knightley not wanting to quarrel with her. How very happy a summer must be before her. She was not to see Frank Churchill this morning. He had told her that he could not allow himself the pleasure of stopping at Hartfield, as he was to be at home by the middle of the day. She did not regret it. Having arranged all these matters, looked them through, and put them all to rights, she was just turning to the house with spirits freshened up for the demands of the two little boys, as well as of their grandpapa, when the great iron sweep-gate opened, and two persons entered whom she had never less expected to see together, Frank Churchill, with Harriet leaning on his arm, actually Harriet, a moment sufficed to convince her that something extraordinary had happened. Harriet looked white and frightened, and he was trying to cheer her. The iron gates and the front door were not twenty yards asunder. They were all three soon in the hall, and Harriet, immediately sinking into a chair, fainted away. A young lady who faints must be recovered. Questions must be answered, and surprises be explained. Such events are very interesting, but the suspense of them cannot last long. A few minutes made Emma acquainted with the whole. Miss Smith and Miss Bickerton, another parlour boarder at Mrs. Goddard's, who had been also at the ball, had walked out together and taken a road, the Richmond Road, which, though apparently public enough for safety, had led them into alarm. About half a mile beyond Highbury, making a sudden turn, and deeply shaded by elms on each side, it became for a considerable stretch very retired, and when the young ladies had advanced some way into it, they had suddenly perceived at a small distance before them, on a broader patch of greensward by the side, a party of gypsies. A child on the watch came towards them to beg, and Miss Bickerton, excessively frightened, gave a great scream, and calling on Harriet to follow her, ran up a steep bank, cleared a slight hedge at the top, and made the best of her way by a short cut back to Highbury. But poor Harriet could not follow. She had suffered very much from cramp after dancing, and her first attempt to mount the bank brought on such a return of it as made her absolutely powerless, and in this state, and exceedingly terrified, she had been obliged to remain. How the trampers might have behaved had the young ladies been more courageous must be doubtful, but such an invitation for attack could not be resisted, and Harriet was soon assailed by half a dozen children, headed by a stout woman and a great boy, all clamorous and impertinent in look, though not absolutely in word. More and more frightened, she immediately promised them money, and taking out her purse gave them a shilling, and begged them to not want more to use her ill. She was then able to walk, though but slowly, and was moving away, but her terror and her purse were too tempting and she was followed, or rather surrounded, by the whole gang, demanding more. In this state Frank Churchill had found her, she trembling and conditioning, they loud and insolent. By a most fortunate chance his leaving Highbury had been delayed so as to bring him to her assistance at this critical moment. The pleasantness of the morning had induced him to walk forward, and leave his horses to meet him by another road, 
a mile or two beyond Highbury, and happening to have borrowed a pair of scissors the night before of Miss Bates, and to have forgotten to restore them, he had been obliged to stop at her door and go in for a few minutes. He was therefore later than he had intended, and being on foot was unseen by the whole party till almost close to them. The terror which the woman and boy had been creating in Harriet was then their own portion. He had left them completely frightened, and Harriet, eagerly clinging to him, and hardly able to speak, had just strength enough to reach Hartfield before her spirits were quite overcome. It was his idea to bring her to Hartfield. He had thought of no other place. This was the amount of the whole story, of his communication and of Harriet's as soon as she had recovered her senses and speech. He dared not stay longer than to see her well. These several delays left him not another minute to lose, and Emma engaging to give assurance of her safety to Mrs. Goddard, and notice of there being such a set of people in the neighbourhood to Mr. Knightley, he set off, with all the grateful blessings that she could utter for her friend and herself. Such an adventure as this, a fine young man and a lovely young woman thrown together in such a way, could hardly fail of suggesting certain ideas to the coldest heart and the steadiest brain. So Emma thought, at least. Could a linguist, could a grammarian, could even a mathematician have seen what she did, have witnessed their appearance together and heard their history of it, without feeling that circumstances had been at work to make them peculiarly interesting to each other? How much more must an imaginist like herself be on fire with speculation and foresight, especially with such a groundwork of anticipation as her mind had already made? It was a very extraordinary thing. Nothing of the sort had ever occurred before to any young ladies in the place within her memory. No rencontre, no alarm of the kind. And now it had happened to the very person, and at the very hour, when the other very person was chancing to pass by to rescue her. It certainly was very extraordinary. And knowing as she did the favourable state of mind of each at this period, it struck her the more. He was wishing to get the better of his attachment to herself, she just recovering from her mania for Mr. Elton. It seemed as if everything united to promise the most interesting consequences. It was not possible that the occurrence should not be strongly recommending each to the other. In the few minutes' conversation which she had yet had with him, while Harriet had been partially insensible, he had spoken of her terror, her naivete, her fervour as she seized and clung to his arm, with a sensibility amused and delighted. And just at last, after Harriet's own account had been given, he had expressed his indignation at the abominable folly of Miss Bickerton in the warmest terms. Everything was to take its natural course, however, neither impelled nor assisted. She would not stir a step nor drop a hint. No, she had had enough of interference. There could be no harm in a scheme, a mere passive scheme. It was no more than a wish. Beyond it she would on no account proceed." Emma's first resolution was to keep her father from the knowledge of what had passed, aware of the anxiety and alarm it would occasion. But she soon felt that concealment must be impossible. Within half an hour it was known all over Highbury. It was the very event to engage those who talk most, the young and the low, and all the youth and servants in the place were soon in the happiness of frightful news. The last night's ball seemed lost in the gypsies. Poor Mr. Woodhouse trembled as he sat, and as Emma had foreseen would scarcely be satisfied without their promising never to go beyond the shrubbery again. It was some comfort to him that many inquiries after himself and Miss Woodhouse, for his neighbours knew that he loved to be inquired after, as well as Miss Smith, were coming in during the rest of the day, and he had the pleasure of returning for answer that they were all very indifferent, which, though not exactly true, for she was perfectly well and Harriet not much otherwise, Emma would not interfere with. She had an unhappy state of health in general for the child of such a man, for she hardly knew what indisposition was, and if he did not invent illness for her, she could make no figure in a message. The gypsies did not wait for the operations of justice, they took themselves off in a hurry. The young ladies of Highbury might have walked again in safety before their panic began, and the whole history dwindled soon into a matter of little importance but to Emma and her nephews. In her imagination it maintained its ground, and Henry and John were still asking every day for the story of Harriet and the gypsies, and still tenaciously setting her right if she varied in the slightest particular from the original recital. End of chapter 3 So... One of the things about this chapter and the way it ended that I thought was important was that it does evolve into just another story we tell and a story that the kids wanted to hear. It reminded me very much of the Bronte sisters. Like the stories and books they were reading were all these, it wasn't bodice rippers per se, but it was all 
you know, dastardly fiends and innocent maidens and all that kind of stuff. So it's it's not surprising that Heathcliff is maligned for his darker skin. In fact, I actually think that at least one of the characters does call him a gypsy at some point or accuse him of being a gypsy. A word that I'm using, knowing that it's no longer acceptable to say, but it was what was written in the book time. These stories, these like needing to repeat the slow motion train wreck that we just encountered does good things for us if the stories compel us to do things wisely and not so good for us if they don't. And this seems to be particularly benign. Mr. Knightley did not have to go and deal with the Romani. He didn't have to get anybody in trouble. Nobody suffered. They just picked up and moved on. Even Harriet hasn't necessarily suffered. She is certainly the center of attention, although that was not her intention. But I think it is an incredibly human chapter. There's always an other, capital O. And I think the important point isn't to stop ourselves from having others in our mind, but to recognize when we do it, just recognize enough to give us pause. Ooh, am I, am I feeding into a stereotype right now? Because, dang, huh, that gives you something to think about. And in thinking about it, that sometimes leads to action. I know that after 9-11, and you know this story, the only thing that saved the kids who I worked with the most was knitting for charity, knitting things for people at the men at the Bowery Mission that got hammered on 9-11, and knitting things for women in need, a women's shelter, run for your life shelter. It was in getting out and doing things for other people, in meeting other people that they found healing. And my kids absolutely had stereotypes about the kinds of people that they were going to encounter and found that they were wrong. And that's awesome. Those are the times when I like being wrong. So I hope you go and listen to Timothy Snyder. I hope that you enjoy, especially his question and answer period at the end. It is something else. And I hope that the realignment of how we look at ourselves and talk about ourselves that Timothy Snyder presents also brings you some calm and understanding. When the world is chaotic, we all grasp at straws. And this isn't so much a straw as it is a life raft. Those of you who've been listening for a long time know that Andrew taught English in Slovakia in 1993, right when Czechoslovakia split into the Czech Republic and Slovakia. That means he was in a little town that had never had an English speaker there, that no longer had any Jews, certainly no, no New Yorkers, and told stories about the importance of the watchtowers at the top of the mountains to watch out for the Turks that were still threatening, but also the way that they talked about who they called gypsies. Before we go, I want to share a voicemail that we got from Jennifer. This is about the housewives, the Husifs, and where you can learn more. So I'm going to let Jennifer play you out, and uh, I'll talk to you later. Have a great week. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Hey, Heather. It's Jennifer from Thursday Night. Um, I think a while back you were talking about housewives, uh, possibly with Emma. Um, and you and your listeners might like to know that there's a nice little article about British military sewing roles, also known as housewives, in the fall uh, 2024 issue of Peacework magazine. And there are also instructions if you're interested in making one yourself. And uh, just in the interest of thoroughness, I checked with my nephew, Nick, who's uh, currently a sergeant in on leave from the U.S. Army, and he tells me that uh, the Army, the U.S. Army, uh, has no such equivalent piece of equipment. Um, he also told me that the only piece of equipment that he knows of in the Army that doesn't come with instructions it is the spoon in the MREs, uh, or Meals Ready to Eat. Um, this issue of Peacework also has an interesting article on darning, for those of us that are interested in such things. 
Um, I'm not sure if you've discussed this or if we talked about it on Thursday night. Um, if so, this ought to draw lots more people to our Zoom call. Anyway, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craplet channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that Craftlet lives. It's, it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. Makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.